You're listening to The Weather Junkies. A winter storm warning is in effect for our area. The snow is in effect at least another two to four inches overnight. Then that snow is The National Weather Service in Huntsville has issued a tornado warning for northwestern Massachusetts. 14 to 22 inches of snow! Good Thursday evening to you, and thank you for joining us here on The Weather Junkies. You probably don't know who is talking. I am back. <laughs> it's good to be back. I'm Tyler Jankowski, joining the show from Connecticut, alongside Dakota Smith, out west. Hey, Tyler. Great to have you back. You know, I was thinking about renaming the show to The Weather Junkie, uh, <laughs> because, uh, you know, we had a little <laughs> hiatus there. I was in the um, doghouse. <laughs> Sorry, I just had to get a jab in there. Um, yeah, no, it is great to have you back. And you were gone for a little, but you were very, very busy at the regional Little League World Series. Tell us a little bit um, about what you were doing over there. Yeah, so it was quite exhausting. Uh, I had to work because of the Olympics, so I couldn't get time off. So I was working from 9 to 5, and then at 5, I would come home, change as quick as possible, and go to Little League, and I would stay there till like midnight or 1. Um, I do a whole bunch of different things. I announce games, which I really enjoy because obviously it's similar to what I do for a career. I, I enjoy that in a live aspect in the ad living, whatever. But I also help out with other a- operations, um, things such as security. I oversee the security force. I am the webmaster for the website. I am kind of the tech troubleshooter so when the when any of the wi-fi's go down i have to figure out what's going on whether it's a, or a tv or or the two-way radio fleet so everything right up my alley i mean i just love it and it's so hard when it ends i i always say my least favorite day of the year is the day after the tournament because it just mixes so many things together that i love you know a lot of people think i coach i don't coach it's just the operations part of the tournament that i love and how could i forget one of the major roles that i have is advising the tournament officials about the weather. Uh, and I would be remiss if I didn't say I'm in a pair. We're a team. My friend Garrett Argianis, who was also a meteorologist here on, on TV in Connecticut, uh, is part of the volunteer weather team. So, uh, you know, we advise when there's a storm coming or if lightning with it is within 10 miles or if we need to tarp the field. And it was a hectic week. I mean, we tarped the field when you include the softball tournament, which is in July. We tarped the field, I believe, seven times. And as a meteorologist providing that guidance, I mean, that is exhausting. Because for baseball, the games are on TV, and you have a lot of people that are in the stands. So obviously, when lightning is threatening, it doesn't matter. You have to make the right call. But still, it's a stressful decision, especially when it's just rain. If it's just rain, you know, you don't want to make the wrong call and have the tarp come out. And, you know, it, it ruins a lot of things. A lot of people go home. They don't come back. If you're on ESPN, you get bumped to ESPNU when you pick up. So it's, it's not easy providing guidance. And I, I don't provide guidance for the World Series, but they had a nasty downpour there today. And I tweeted out, I didn't envy those people that were providing whatever information they could because it just flared up there on the ridge in Pennsylvania. So that's a, a little bit long-winded version of what I've been doing the last couple of weeks. Yeah, that is a lot. Holy cow. Um, can't imagine how busy you are over there. And uh, I, I saw you, you tweet out something today about a shower that went over where, the, where Little League is and um, how you can never be too cautious about putting out the tarp early. Yeah, especially, uh, when, especially when things are just flaring up all over the place because it doesn't hurt. I mean, you could pull a dry tarp in minutes. It's not a big deal. But if you have to redo the field, that's a mess. And yeah. um, it, it, I think the really cool thing for me is – and it's similar to TV, but I think it's even better in that you see the real meteorology in action, your decision making. You know, you make a decision for lightning safety or for rain for the field, and all of a sudden, like, so many people are impacted by what you just said. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually doing a little bit of looking into some event safety things um, for an upcoming podcast. So um, I'll probably want to get your input on that uh, moving forward. So let's. Let's get into the show here, get into our normal routine. Uh, Weather in our backyard today, it's been a pretty nice day in Colorado. We had 
a little bit of a little bit of a front move through. It's been pretty hot out here like normal, uh, but it's going to get really, really chilly over the weekend. Unseasonably cool temperatures, um, cool conditions. Sorry, temperatures cannot be cool, as John Neese once told me. Um, <laughs> and then uh, we actually might see some snow in the mountains way up there, um, which is not terribly uncommon for August, but it's also not something that happens every August. And uh, yeah, so Tyler, how's it on the East Coast? Well, the last time I was on the show, I kept <clears throat> harping on the fact that we hadn't had much sustained humidity. And in my absence, we had some of the worst humidity I can ever remember here. And it was for about five days where the dew point was between 75 and 80 degrees. The dew point, not the temperature. And the all-time record dew point here in the Hartford area is 80 two i believe and we got to like 78 for like three days in a row and that was during the baseball regional and i was outside and i don't sweat a lot but i was just sweating from stepping outside the air conditioning it was just gross but now uh, things are settling down and the sun is setting earlier and uh, it feels like fall is around the corner it is it really is but that also means football so it does that's that's the one thing that i'm latching on to I'm going to miss baseball, though. i got to be honest. I'm a big Orioles fan, and I love coming home and just sitting down and watching a baseball game every night. Uh, but Sundays and Saturdays will be more jam-packed, more action-packed. Um, yeah, so let's get into our tweets. We have uh, quite a few this week, and uh, our main segment will be with a forecaster from the uh, Weather Prediction Center, uh, Brendan Rubin Oster. Uh, he, he did some of the forecasting for the Louisiana flooding, and that's a pre-recorded interview. We'll do that in a bit. And we'll also have a tweet dedicated to some of the Louisiana flooding. Uh, but first, we have a tweet from uh, Jason Farlow. He wrote a piece on his blog slash website. And the tweet says, Allen County warning demonstrates why tornado si sirens aren't your best alert source. Uh, and it shows uh, a map here of a tornado warning polygon and a little bit of the polygon gets into one a, a county, um, Allen County, Indiana, and it sets off sirens for uh, parts of parts of that county. Um, he he, it really goes through it very in, in a lot of detail to show where the sirens are and where the tornado warning actually is for. And it's only because that polygon got into a little bit of that county to set it off. Um, so this was widely shared this week. Really great write-up, so thanks for doing that, Jay. Uh, Tyler, do you guys have uh, tornado sirens, uh, I guess, issues in the Northeast? We, we don't have sirens that I know of. I do know that there are a number of volunteer fire departments that have sirens to signify a call coming in, and it's possible that some of those departments use them for weather. I don't know that, though. I don't think so. Um, but this is, I mean, if you look at the maps on this link, it's horrendous. The county is huge, and it's only clipping it. I, I almost wonder why they included the tornado warning for that county because I know a lot of times the weather service offices will clip the warnings almost like it's the old days uh, where they don't go into the new county when it's not needed. Yeah, and, and, needed. and even that looks weird at some points, but then you realize that they're doing it for a reason. Yeah. Like this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess they. I don't know, miss that or it felt like they didn't, they, they weren't going to do that. You know, it, maybe it didn't matter. This, is, this brings up another point kind of adding to the weather in our backyard segment. We had our first tornado here in Connecticut in the last couple of years. It was uh, last week. It was an EF0, and we didn't know about it until an hour after it happened. <laughs> um, so just a little fun fact. I mean, it was, it was very close to a leaf pile spinning around in the fall. I mean, it was not very much, but it was a tornado. Yeah. Uh, so let's get on to our next tweet here uh, from Kelton Halbert. Um, you can follow him at Tempest Chasing. He's a student, uh, in, uh, undergrad student in the University of Oklahoma. And his tweet says, once you learn this one trick to buoyancy, nothing will get you down. Hashtag weather clickbait. And after that, People went crazy with the hashtag weather clickbait, at least in the weather community, and it spewed off a ton of hilarious, hilarious tweets. Um, Tyler, did you pick up on this? I saw the weather clickbait hashtag going around um, about long-range forecasts. But yeah, it looks like, didn't this, this guy start 
a hashtag before? He did. He start. He started the um, how to start a Met fight, yes. which was yes. also hilarious. Um, yeah, I wish I could be as good as good at making hashtags as Kelton was. Uh, I'm gonna read it. Apparently, a... trademark hashtags or something nowadays. Oh, uh, like Rio. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so this one got trending too. I did not see that one. Um, let's see. I was looking through for a few of my favorites. <laughs> Let's see. I, I had a few. They weren't that great. Um, yeah, this one's from Jesse McDonald. You can follow her at jmezzo212. Meteorologists from your town are baffled by this new weather phenomenon. Hashtag weather clickbait. Um, the Weather Channel's Jim Cantori saw thunder snow during a hurricane, and he won't believe what happened next. Hashtag weather clickbait. That's from Jamie Oberdeck. Um, yeah, the, if you do a quick search of hashtag weather clickbait, um, you'll be laughing for quite some time. Um, so let's move on to our next tweet. And uh, this one is also kind of funny. Um, it's from Steve Silver. You can follow him at Steve TSRA. He says he's a professional meteorologist and avid Penn State fan. Um, his tweet says, any TV meteorologist who, whose station covers the Farmer's Almanac as news should threaten to do on-air forecasts by a Ouija board. Tyler, you use the Farmer's Almanac this year? <laughs> no, we don't. <laughs> I do know that they followed us, though, so that was, this is worth it. <laughs> um, no, we don't, we don't cover the Farmer's Almanac, and whenever someone brings it up, someone has not yet. I have not gotten a question yet, but I'm bound to in probably September or October, and I, I got to try not to flip out. I, I actually... My mom will pro I can't hear you. Can you hear me? Hmm. Well, I was going to say my mom will probably come home and tell me that she read that squirrel tails are bushy and that the acorns are big and we're going to get three feet of snow. Modern technology always throws curveballs, especially when the name Google is associated with it. I cannot hear Dakota right now. I don't know if he can hear me. But we are still streaming live from what I can tell here. Tyler? Yes, can you hear me now? It's weird. I couldn't hear you, and I was talking a lot. I was talking a lot, too, and I couldn't hear you. So who knows what went out over the air? <laughs> <laughs> All right, you want to lead us into our uh, next tweet here? I was just going to add in, in case that didn't go out, that my mom's probably going to come tell me in September that she read the squirrel tails are bushy and the acorns are big and we're going to get three feet of snow. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. What about the woolly bear caterpillars? <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> but, um, yes, the next one, oh, we have a couple on the same topic. Yeah. Uh, Matthew Roan, who is an avid tweeter from central Pennsylvania, caught a spelling error in the... AFD from NWS State College, they called a storm an impressive blow with an L, blow echo. <laughs> I don't, chose, I didn't, what do you have to say? You chose the tweet. I didn't even look if they corrected it, but um, this, uh, this is like the second time they've had a big mix-up um, this, this week, I think. Mix-up. Um, on the 15th, on Tuesday, they, uh, Monday, sorry, they, they tweeted, um, an area of heavy snow will affect north central Fulton and northeastern Bedford, blah, blah, blah. And then they attached a, um, a link to something that describes the, the heavy snow. And, you know, someone just pressed the wrong button and, and typed the wrong thing in to put out. They, they were looking for, I believe, a thunderstorm, uh, a special weather statement. Just to confirm that it wasn't an erroneous saved tweet draft, I actually clicked on it, and indeed it says Monday, August 15th, 2016, with the heavy snow. That was hilarious. And just to, I mean, just to make it worth it, the towns included were Shy Beaver <laughs> and Broad Top City. I know you love getting into your uh, Pennsylvania uh, town names. <laughs> but, but the other thing that I thought was interesting was they didn't issue what they wanted to issue for another nine minutes. Nine and they minutes kept the tweet up. And the they tweet kept the tweet up. up which <laughs> I, thought, I thought it was like an elaborate plan to get a bunch of follows and retweets. 
because it it got forty one retweets, probably more than most of their warnings get. So it looks like two other weather service offices commented, "I'm more jealous," and somebody hit the wrong button in Warren Gen. <laughs> yeah, that's. I can't. I can't believe they didn't delete it, but I don't know. I guess everyone realized that it was a mistake because. Well, imagine know. if it was a tornado warning and they didn't. They didn't notice for 10 minutes. right I don't know. yeah no that would be now that would be bad then yeah luckily they luckily it was heavy sewn um yeah so rough rough week for national weather service they call it they have blow echoes and heavy snow across central pennsylvania i wonder if the campus weather service picked up on that this week <laughs> um our last tweet leads us right into our main topic and it's some imagery of the uh, louisiana flooding from scott Balkmeyer, you can follow him at C I M S S underscore satellite. And uh, it shows a, I believe it shows a rainfall. It's a, it's a national rainfall map. And it shows some really impressive uh, precipitation amounts in along the Gulf Coast in southern Louisiana. Uh, and then along with that, it has an infrared imagery of some of the cloud tops, some pretty cool cloud tops with, uh, I guess, just the barrage of tropical moisture that uh, this thing brought in. Pretty remarkable uh, stuff down there that they got. Um, this very scary situation. They've had a few deaths, and um, and that's what spurred uh, the show this week. Tyler, have you been following this? I don't know a whole lot about it, except for it was really bad. I've seen a few pictures, and I saw some rainfall reports. Wasn't one over 30 inches? Yeah, I believe so. I that's I don't know if I've ever seen one like that before. But I did also see people commenting that it wasn't getting much national coverage, and I'm not sure why. I don't know if it's because of the Olympics or what. Yeah, there's been I feel like there's been more criticism of the coverage of the event than how everyone's handling it and the forecast of it. Uh, I there's been a, numerous articles. I think uh, Marshall Shepard wrote some for Forbes, and then Capital Weather Gang had some. <clears throat> um, about the lack of coverage. And I, yeah, I think it was kind of like a perfect storm of, um, no pun intended there, of the Olympics going on. And we've had a lot of flooding recently. So, you know, it's not something that, I don't know, is, is grabbing people's attention as much right now. I think um, the location and population definitely matters because if that was in New York City or Washington, D.C., it would, it would be top story all the time. Yeah, and that's pretty unfortunate. Um, yeah, and then I, so on the, uh, on the other side of that, I saw someone uh, tweet out, let's see, I'll search for it, but they, they were tweeting how they thought, uh, they were comparing the rainfall of this and the rainfall of Katrina. Uh, let's see, it's, it was Scott Sable. Uh, he's a meteorologist um, at Fox in Cleveland, Ohio. And he tweeted out the rainfall maps of Katrina and the, this re most recent event. And Katrina, there was a lot less rain. Um, that wasn't, you know, the main impact of Katrina. And he tweeted, Hurricane Katrina, rain, Louisiana rainfall versus recent extreme Louisiana rainfall. Guess what received the most coverage? And, you know, obviously Katrina got more coverage because it was a bigger event and impacted more people and, you know, was a bigger threat to life and property. Um, I think he kind of backtracked. He didn't play the tweet, but he backtracked and said, you know, that wasn't what he was trying to say. He didn't. He doesn't think this should get more coverage than Katrina or as much coverage. Just that he thought it should get more. Um, yeah, it's weird. I feel like there's been a lot more talk about the coverage of this than the actual, um, the actual, than the actual coverage of this. It's it's kind of weird. Um, but yeah, that that leads us right into our main uh, segment tonight with uh, Brendan Rubin Oster. Uh, he's a meteorologist at the Weather Prediction Center. He actually wrote several of the precipitation uh, mesoscale discussions, kind of like your um, mesoscale discussions during severe weather. And uh, we had some really good insight from him about what, what it was like at the WPC and some of the things that they were doing before, during, and after the forecast. Um, so let's get to that right now. And now we're joined by Brendan Rubin Oster. He's a forecaster at the Weather Prediction Center, uh, a branch of the National Weather Service in the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association um, administration. Sorry, uh, Brendan got his bachelor's and master's in, in atmospheric and oceanic sciences at UCLA. Uh, he's been with the 
uh, Weather Prediction Center since 2006. It did go through a name change during that time. Uh, Brendan, thanks so much for joining us today. Oh, you're very welcome. I'm glad to be here. So one of the things we usually ask uh, people who come on is how you kind of got your start in weather and meteorology and, and where you found your passion um, in this community. So I grew up in Southern California where we don't get much weather. So I was more inspired by what I saw on TV on Weather Channel and such. Um, I was used to fog and smog and fires. But um, I lived in Texas for a little while, got into storm chasing. And so I really got interested in business and meteorology. And I've been an active storm chaser every, every year for about two weeks in May, 2006. And while I'm in D.C., I enjoy the winter weather aspect, which I never got growing up as a kid. And I enjoy um, freezing rain events and got a couple um, tropical cyclones um, launcher nearby. So it's got a nice diversity of weather phenomena to um, uh, quench my thirst, as you say. <laughs> Gotcha. And so right now you're a forecaster at the Weather Prediction Center. What's kind of your day-to-day -day role um, over there? I, I, I know you said you're kind of a mesoscale focus, um, but what, what kind of things you do every day there? So um, the Weather Prediction Center, by name, you can tell we have a diverse uh, uh, array of um, forecasts. We do anything ranging from surface analysis, which is a pseudo intern desk, and ranging all the way to the medium range where we help um, put out forecasts that go on grids to be used uh, by um, NDF, by the National Weather Service offices. But we've also taken on um, a lot of other roles. We have in Alaska a desk focusing on four to eight day forecasting. And then kind of our bread and butter would be our QPF forecasting, which is what we are known for. And we do QPF forecasts um, every day. Um, we do day one through day seven. And so my role, we took on this role in uh, about three or four years ago from the Storm Prediction Center. We issued a well presentation discussions for areas we expect heavy rainfall, which may cause uh, flash flooding. And uh, so we've been on that for about four years, and we've been issuing a lot of them, especially the last couple of years. Yeah, I noticed that you're, uh, you were the forecaster on a bunch of the mesoscale precipitation discussions for the most recent flood in Louisiana. And you use some some strong language in there, really, you know, issue, um, making a point that flash flooding in certain areas could happen, and um, that these areas need to be ready for this. So I'm curious, what what was kind of the what what was it like at the Weather Prediction Center when you were issuing issuing these um, mesoscale discussions for such a a big event and high impact event? So, of course, uh, the field offices had it even a little bit more difficult because they're the ones actually issuing all the flash flood warnings and flood warnings for the event. But um, <clears throat> in terms of just putting out the forecast and following it from, because we were following this event from about day five, it was showing up in a lot of the models, and we knew it would be a very busy set of night shifts for us. And just having that, that going, and we knew the meteorological setup was absolutely phenomenal for a heavy rainfall event. And the system, I don't know if everyone knew, but the system uh, originated in the northeastern Gulf of Mexico and kind of meandered about the Florida Panhandle for a few days before flooding very slowly westward. And eventually, about five days later, it finally settled into southeast Louisiana. And overall, we knew it was kind of a slam dunk in terms of the flash flooding occurring, even though the area is uh, heavily uh, influenced by swamp land, which is hard to flood, but when you have 20 to 30 inches of rain falling in like a three to five day period, it doesn't matter what, if, what your soil types are, it's going to flood at that point. Have you worked on an event um, this high impact? And if so, what, what are some of the, I guess, comparisons and contrasts from this event to other flooding events that you've forecasted for? So in the past couple of years, two other events have come to mind. Uh, I don't know if anyone remembers from October of last year in 2015, we were dealing with the potential of uh, hurricane or tropical storm Joaquin coming towards the East Coast. All the while, there's also going to be a, a separate setup of um, a heavy precipitation event across the Carolinas, in particular South Carolina. And that one, like the Louisiana event, had a really strong signal in the models. A lot of the uh, models with the GFS and the NAM and European we're showing 10 to 15 inches of rain in 24 hours, which our forecasters like 
had an intense second look at it, wondering if it was being too robust due to feedback issues in the models or what. But uh, that was an incredible event. That was a multi day event, which again led to, I uh, can't remember the numbers, but very high amounts. But one thing that worked in their favor was they had upslope against the southern Appalachians, which led even um, tougher issues because of the terrain driven activity. And the other big event was uh, one that emanated out of Maryland and, and Delaware, which uh, occurred, I think, about two or three years ago in Icebrook, uh, Long Island. And they had, I think, 11 or 12 inches in three hours. They had five inch hour rain rate. Uh, they actually had 5.10 inches in one hour. I had never seen it like that before. Oh, um, so how long have you guys been following this before it started? What was kind of the was it like a couple days or a week before? Did you see something setting up in, in the models beforehand? So uh, we look at basically, we have a lot of uh, data to look at at the Christian Center. We get a lot of ensemble data and the solutions were by like day five or day six, way out in the medium range forecast realm. They're showing this like very slow moving upper low across the, the Northeast Gulf. Uh, I know the Hurricane Center in Miami was following it for potential tropical development, but I think they kept the percentage at 10%. So it was very low end. It was more just a quasi-stationary uh, mid-upper level low. But we knew one thing was that moisture was incredibly high. The crystal water values were 99th percentile near record. And so we saw that signal. But again, it was more the speed of the system than anything. If you have that much moisture, if it's moving, at least that which can move the rainfall around. But the fact that the uh, solutions were showing it being nearly stationary was concerning. And even then, looking back, the models are still too fast and drifting that thing westward. It actually uh, was even slower than that. So it was even slower than any model we looked at looking ahead. So when you were looking at the, or sorry, when you're making the um, mesoscale discussions, do you take into um, account the, I guess, at, at the surface things that, that are going on, like topography and areas of residence, areas of commercial, or, um, or I, I'm, I, mean, I know you take into account rivers. I, that might be more of a, of a national, a WFO uh, thing, but, but what, what else do you take, in, take into consideration besides just the rainfall amounts? So I look at the antecedent conditions. Uh, I usually look at the past uh, seven days of rainfall, kind of see what the departure from normal is, just to see how susceptible this area to flooding. And we use flash flood guidance, which comes from the river forecast centers, but we take it with a grain of salt because even if the guidance values are high, saying those conditions are uh, dry and can handle a lot of rainfall, we've proven to see time and time again that heavy bursts of rainfall in short periods of time can flood pretty much anything. It doesn't matter, even if the thing says three and a half inches in one hour via flood, you can get it at much lower levels just given intense rain rates. And while population isn't the first and um, primary uh, thing we look at to issue, we do at least consider that if we're writing a message, we might make mention of urbanized issues, but we would never um, issue a discussion just based on the urbanized flooding uh, alone. I like, I like what you said there, a big burst of rain can pretty much flood anywhere. Um, and what about specific to the Louisiana flooding? What were some of the uh, other things that impacted the flooding besides just the enormous amount of rainfall? Or was it, you know, just that? Um, to me, it was really just the meteorology working and the fact that the soil just couldn't handle that much rain and the drainage systems were not, uh, I mean, it's hard to say any drainage system should be up to par to handle uh, 10 to 15 inches of rain in a day, because that's very hard to run all that water off and keep it away from damaging civilization. And I mean, I've seen some pretty surreal satellite images of before and after. I mean, there's so much water everywhere. And, and again, Louisiana, as far as I know, is pretty flat for the most part. And so, and, I mean, imagine if there was topography involved in this, it, it could have been you know, a lot worse if the area wasn't as flat as it is. <laughs> So there's been a lot of discussion um, within the media and on social media about the flooding not getting a lot of coverage, and I'm, you know, the forecasts and the science behind it is pretty objective. You know, you you look at what's going to happen and and you forecast for it just as much as you would forecast for something else. So I'm curious, what um, at, at the WPC has there been um, 
anything like that or is it just you guys are forecasting what you see and that's pretty much the bottom line well um because while we're forecasting we do get a lot of interaction with um for us we get a lot of media attention we get a lot of phone calls so while we're doing these forecasts and issuing these graphics um we're also communicating with our partners which are a lot of um we'll get phone calls from like CBS, Radio News, Fox, and uh, Wall Street Journal, Reuters, Associated Press. And so we often, even though we're just issuing forecasts, we're also conveying um, certain impacts that are occurring. They'd like to know what, um, what it is actually doing, where is it going. And at the time, like the flooding was occurring, we, uh, we didn't get too much information about that at first. It was more the aftermath. I really got to see what was actually happening. But in, Real time, I knew we had to had to be on our game because this area was getting, you know, a deluge of heavy rainfall. And again, while we don't have the the um, kind of stress level of a forecast office, we've actually issued the warnings and having to deal with the emergency managers in local community. Um, it still is a pretty intense set of days for all the forecasters. So getting information from the ground, um, observations from the ground is pretty important for you guys when you're doing some of these forecasts? Yeah, so while I'm working, I'll look at a combination of things. I'll look at a lot of mesonet data, because just the first order of charts is kind of spread out across the United States. So I want to get a little more um, coverage of the precipitation amount. Of course, cocoa rise, but only someone comes up and the morning and people um, empty their gauges and tell us how much they have. And I'll use the uh, an NWS chat, which um, I can communicate with the field offices and, and look at what emergency managers and other reporters are um, telling me what's actually occurring on the ground. <clears throat> yeah, you know, I, I think a lot of people miss how much communication and interaction is going on behind the scenes that you don't see. Because uh, every time I talk to someone who's working with forecasts in a high impact event, there's always, you know, dozens of people and organizations that they're talking to. and I, uh, it's a lot to keep track of. I'm, I'm impressed by the activity, how, how you guys keep up with all that. Oh, yeah, I agree. I'd most people just see the end price, and you never know what the road would like to get there. Yeah. So um, one last question we ask to everyone who comes on the show. Um, what is some advice that you would give to a, someone who wants to be a forecaster or be in the field of meteorology um, for, their, for their future career path? Well, one thing you definitely have to know is, like, if you, you know, you love meteorology, that's why we're all here. Um, we um, definitely recommend that you be um, ready and be prepared to spend a lot of time with math, physics, chemistry, and computer, especially computer science these days. Uh, just the computer programming is becoming a bigger and bigger thing because um, while forecasting is still what it was, you know, 10, 20 years ago, there's a direction of the models are getting better and just learning more about the models <clears throat> and using the programming languages we have access to to create new tools to utilize this information has become a bigger and bigger thing. And uh, to be competitive in say, getting into a meteorology job, it seems like bachelor, bachelor's degree is no longer sufficient. Most people come out with master's degrees at this point. Um, that's one of the reasons why I say to get a master's degree, I realize it's getting uh, uber competitive. Um, and then besides just the meteorology itself, there is also the uh, lifestyle. It, the lifestyle is a big thing Like you have uh, to do uh, shift work. And I didn't realize what that really meant until I got into it. Uh, I rotate uh, every four or five weeks. I go through sets of day shifts, uh, which start really early to go to evening shifts. And eventually I do a set of second night shifts, which take me home in rush hour. Uh, and so... It's, it, it takes you away from family, friends, and so you have to really enjoy what you're doing and because it does require a huge lifestyle change and have a lot of impacts on you. Yeah, I think you're right. I think a lot of people don't uh, realize the the shifts and the, the days that you'll be working and the hours that you'll be working. So, you know, thanks for that because I, I would have, <laughs> I don't know, I, that would be quite the adjustment, I think, for, for most of us. Um, so thanks for that. Oh yeah, and I'm a night. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I'm a, I'm a night on myself. But I've been up till six or seven a.m. Different story. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, thanks so much for talking with us, and uh, best of luck uh, with the forecast over at the Weather Prediction Center. Oh sure, thanks for having me. I really enjoyed this. Thanks. 
back. Uh, that was our interview with Brendan, uh, Ruben o Oster, and uh, great, great talk. Really learned a lot about some of the operations of the WPC and some of the things that he has to do there and some of the behind the scenes as you don't see. Um, you know, they're talking with a lot of people during situations like these. They're talking to media outlets. They're talking to emergency managers. Um, they're talking to WFOs, local weather forecast offices. And, um, and you know, the list goes on and on that we don't really see. All we see is the forecast and the product. Um, but really, they have a lot going on over there. Um, so thanks again, Brennan, for um, taking some time to talk with us. He actually mentioned that he was the weather geek of the week on the Weather Geeks, the show by... Uh, hosted by Dr. Marshall Shepard, um, and I guess they just pick people. They, it's not something you submit to; you just you get picked, and I think you get recommended by someone. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, maybe one day one of the weather junkies will be the weather geek of the week. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, yeah. yeah, so that was a good, really cool interview. Yeah, need to have him on. I don't think the Weather Prediction Center gets as much love as the Storm Prediction Center, but I will say <laughs> I go on their website every day. Uh, yeah, I, love, I think you're right. One of the things I love is their fronts that they draw because you know a human has actually looked at things and put something together. Um, yeah. So that's usually a good starting point for seeing, for things. But it's always fascinating to me that everyone clings to the Storm Prediction Center outlooks, but the Weather Prediction Center issues outlooks in mesoscale discussions too. But I bet you a lot of people don't know that. No, I I think you're right. I I actually didn't know they did the. Um, the precip precipitation mesoscale discussions until the other week. Um, but I think they're just as important, especially for situations, you know, uh, like this. I'm curious if they, I know the Storm Prediction Center does the winter weather mesoscale discussions. I wonder why the Weather Prediction Center doesn't do those, or maybe they are going to start doing those instead of the Storm Prediction Center. Um, oh, you mean this SPC issues stuff during a winter storm? Yeah, yeah. And it would make sense to do to be at the Weather Prediction Center instead. Isn't it always convection based? Yeah, I guess you're right. But I mean, so was the. Well, I guess. Yeah, I guess okay. you're right on that. It's, it's an interesting uh, battle between the same organization. Well, um, I guess it doesn't yeah, really it, matter as long as it gets out. It's very cool though when you see a mesoscale discussion in, in a snowstorm. Oh, that that's when you know it's it means business. Um, <laughs> You look for the, they, you know, they always mention if, if there's a chance of uh, thunder snow, and that always gets me going. Um, yeah, so I had, a, oh, he's the, just a side note here, he's the second Weather Prediction Center uh, forecaster we've had on. Do you, do you know the other one? Paul Cosin. Hey, there you go, yeah. Yeah, I was looking through the staff directory the other day, and I was like, oh, hey, we've had, a, we've had someone on before. Um, and he actually does, he usually does the Alaska office forecast, I believe, most of the time. Um, so they get some, I guess they get snow up there for him to forecast for. Um, <laughs> that's his specialty. <laughs> so I wanted to do a few plugs here before we sign off. Um, we have a new website. Well, we have a website. It is new, but we never had one before. So um, it's theweatherjunkies.com. And before every episode, we'll post, we'll put a blog post up with the main segment and some of the tweets that we're going to talk about. So you can follow along there. Uh, we also generally, we tweet out during the show what we're um, talking about. So you can follow along two ways if you want, but the blog post makes it nice and easy to just scroll down through the tweets. And you know, there's also a link there to go to the YouTube page to listen in. And yeah, I think that's all I had. Um, we will have another episode next week. Um, and we'll also have another episode of Weather Ready or Not, starting to make that a monthly thing. And we're also going to add on someone to the team for those podcasts. Um, look for that announcement later in the week. Um, so if you're not following us on Twitter, you can follow us at the WX Junkies. We're also on Facebook. Um, and you can listen to this podcast on SoundCloud, YouTube, iTunes, Stitcher, any real podcast platform that you listen to. And give us, please give us a rating or review. I'm begging you. A rating and review, and I will be so happy, um, especially on iTunes. That helps us get noticed uh, by iTunes software, which is always good. And um, next week, we'll have on Mike Mogul, 
Um, so that'll be an interesting episode, definitely different than anything we've had. He does a lot of work with education in weather and some of the, he's actually a, um, he's a certified, he's, he's a CCM, Certified Consulting Meteorologist, and he does some work for uh, court cases, which is, he's like a forensic meteorologist on the side, um, which is really interesting. So, um, yeah, I think that's it. Tyler, you want to send us off? Yeah, thanks for joining us this Thursday. August ticking by pretty quickly. We'll have another show, though, as we said, next week. We hope that you'll join us right back here next week. But for this evening's show, for Brendan, Dakota, and me, thank you for listening, and we'll be back next week.